First John 3, same author of the Gospel of John. We've got a lot of Johns here today. <laughs> a few Johns. Amen. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, that's you. All right, folks, that's you, your beloved. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath this hope purifieth, in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither, know, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. I want to speak this morning on this subject, an identity crisis. An identity crisis. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Truly, how great thou art. Lord, we've enjoyed singing about the cross. Lord, we have been reminded again as we've sang the awesome sacrifice that was undertaken that we may have our sins forgiven, that we may be called the sons of God. And you're our Father. Lord, you said in your word that you are not ashamed to call us brethren. What a privilege that is. Father, as we look at this subject this morning, I do pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding. I pray, Lord, that there would be victory in our heart, that we would leave this morning with our burdens gone. I don't know what people are carrying this morning, but you do, Lord, and I pray that uh, through the singing and through the preaching of your word, that burdens may be lifted, that your people may leave here free and able to praise you in such a freedom that perhaps they've never experienced before. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help me in preaching to undertake this. Uh, we should not lightly esteem it. It is of great importance and of great value. And I pray, Holy Father, that you would be exalted and lifted up and all men will be drawn under the Lord Jesus this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who are you? Who are you? When we come to church and we get together, we say, hey, John, good to see you. Hey, Peter, Sarah, good to see you. Michelle, good to see you. But who are you? When we think about our identity, we need to think about this very fact that we are the sons or the children of God. That's who we are. We'll look more at that in a minute. But when we think about an identity and we think about an, an identity crisis, I would say that the world, because of the liberal left, have caused great confusion when it comes to identifying who we are. I mean, I have no issue in identifying who I am. I'm, a, I'm an Australian. I'm a male. Uh, I'm married to a, a lady. Uh, you know, I'm a pastor. I, I, I know who I am in regards to the world, but I'm glad that I know who I am in Christ. You see, the world wants to bring confusion. And of course, we know that Satan is the God, small g of this world, and he's the author of confusion. 
and uh, he wants people confused as far as their uh, gender, gender fluidity and all that sort of thing that's going on today. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you're up to date with different things, but the Greens now are trying to pass a bill uh, that's going to affect religious freedoms and in particular the preaching of the word, especially when it comes to preaching against the things that the world is for. You know, they don't, they don't want messages preached that Jesus is the only way. They don't want... Uh, messages preached that husband uh, marriage is between a man and a woman and uh, they don't want things preached as far as uh, that there is a, a gender identity when it comes to God. God made man and woman. He made male and female. There's no trans. There's no there's no waking up one day and thinking I decide that I might identify today as a tree. You know, there's none of that in God's eyes. But the world would have us think that we could uh, wake up and ident- whatever you want to identify with, that's okay. You know, I was thinking about that even when we were at the, we were at the supermarket the other day and, and uh, you know, we're, actually we were at Costco. Oh, Costco. And uh, for some it's a great, ch- I mean, there's so many people down there, it'd be a great church, you know what I mean? Uh, but I was going to the, 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 the bathrooms there and I was thinking, you know, if I was of the persuasion that I wanted to identify as a woman, I don't have to go into the bathroom. I could go over here because I identify as a female. And that's the craziness of the world. There's an identity crisis when it comes to the things of this world. But can I say to you also that I believe there's even an identity crisis when it comes to Christianity. Who are you? You, according to the Bible, are a child, a son or a daughter of God Almighty. All because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and our receiving of him as our saviour. So when we think about an identity crisis and when we, when we think about wanting to identify, I hope and pray that this morning that you identify as a son or as a daughter and, and not, as, not something that you might have heard some religious thinking some like you remember last week this is really part two of last week by the way because last week we looked about the heart and how that people say the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked but according to the new testament our heart has been purified so who are you going to believe the word of god or the word of a man i'd rather believe the word of god to be honest with you so when it comes to identifying yourself, do you identify yourself as a, as a, 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 just a low down worm, I'm a wretch, I'm a filthy sinner? Oh, but Jacob identified himself as that. Yeah, but we're going into the Old Testament again. Who are you in Christ when it comes to the New Testament? Who are you now that you've been born again, washed in the blood? What is your standing before God Almighty? Are you just some low down worm that God just, uh, you know, if you, if you look at him the wrong way, God will just flick you off the planet and say, oh, don't look at me the wrong way. How dare you? Now listen to me. God is our Heavenly Father and he loves you. Amen. And he loves me. Now that doesn't say he's not going to chastise us if we as his children do things wrong. He is a loving God. He's a righteous God. He is still a God of judgment. But the judgment of our sin has already been placed on Christ on the cross. And Jesus was manifested, the Bible says, to take away our sin. Hallelujah. Did you pick it up in 1 John chapter 3? Did you see that? Can I just skip ahead? I've been thinking about this all week. I was actually going to share it Wednesday night at the Bible study. So I'm glad you're all here. I don't have to share it again on Wednesday. Look at verse number nine. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Did you see that? Wow. What does that mean? We're going to look at that this morning. What does that mean for us as Christians that I'm a a child of God, I'm a son of God, and I I don't hang up, but I sin. Yeah, but do you remember last week we looked at the difference between the spirit man and the flesh? So when you think about an identity and you think about an identity crisis, this is where a lot of Christians are struggling in their Christian life. This is why there's so much uh, uh, oppression slash depression, whatever you want to call it, amongst Christians, because they don't renew their mind. They don't renew their thinking to what God says they are now that they're in Christ. 
If you were to renew your mind to who you are in Christ and you woke up tomorrow thinking, you know what, praise the Lord, I am a child of God. He is my father. Jesus is my saviour. He is my brother. My sins are washed. My sins are forgiven. I am a new creature in Christ. As a matter of fact, we'll look at some scripture in a minute. I have newness of spirit. Praise the Lord. You see, when you're baptised, folks, it's not just some wonderful thing that we get to have a look at. There is such deep meaning in the picture of baptism that, that you're, you're buried as the, as the old man is buried. And you're raised to walk in newness of life. God gave you a new heart, a new spirit to serve him. That is who you are. Amen. Hallelujah for that. Firstly, I want you to look at the privileged relationship. Have a look at uh, verse 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now, you should circle that, highlight it, underline it. Now are we the sons of God. You're not waiting to be a son of God. You are now a present tense child of a holy God. Praise God. Wow, that's amazing. We were sharing before. I want you to hold your place here. I want to share this. I mentioned it in um, uh, Bible class this morning. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is the wickedness of modern versions. The, the wickedness of modern versions. And in particular, and I don't want to tread on toes, I do it anyway, I don't know why I apologize, I just, I do it, I don't mean to hurt people, honestly, but it's like, if you don't have the Word of God, then get a copy of the Word of God, amen, get a, get a King James Bible. Look at verse number 18, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved... It is the power of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? But let me tell you what modern versions say, and in particular the New King James. For the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing foolishness, but unto us which are being saved, it is the power of God. Let me tell you, there is no being saved. Amen. When you trusted Christ, you were saved. You Amen. were made a it is not a process that you have to work through that's works based that's, that's taking Christ out of the equation and, and, and he's over here and you're working at being saved no Jesus when he died on the cross and shed his blood and you called upon him you became such a, a privileged person you were placed into the family of God God is now your father Jesus is your saviour but he is also your brother and you are now present tense a born again child of God you are now a son of God but if we were to believe modern versions it's something that we're working through how can we do that that's just wickedness wickedness privileged relationship uh, we're going to look at some scriptures that were right this morning I want you to go to the gospel of John where brother John read from look at John chapter 1 John chapter 1 do you not think that Satan's modus operandi is to still corrupt the word of God? Yeah. Man, if you don't have a copy of the word of God, then where's your, where's your, where's your security? Where's your uh, uh, foundation? How do you know what to believe? Are you being saved or are you saved? I am saved. Uh, it's a present tense thing. I'm not like, let's go out door knocking, Jeff, so that we can be being saved. You know what I mean? We don't do what we do to be saved because Jesus did the work. Amen, that's, right. that's, a, that's, the, that's the privilege of being a Christian. That's the privilege of, of being in the family of Almighty God. Who, By the way, you know, he does love us. Amen. He does love us. And I tell you what, if your upbringing uh, and you had a, a father that was... Um, uh, very. Let, let me just say, he's either authori an authoritarian or uh, uh, he was absent or, or whatever it was. If you didn't have a, a good upbringing, more often than not, your perspective of your heavenly father is drawn by your relationship or non-relationship with your earthly father. 
So for those of us who never had a dad around, we have battled all our life to accept a holy and heavenly Father who loves and blesses and wants, wants good things for me. We struggle with that. But we again, renewing our mind to this privileged relationship of who we are in Jesus Christ. Was it not Jesus that said when we pray, our Father? When the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ was sent into your heart, He was sent into your heart crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Do your kids call you, what do they call you? Daddy, Dad, isn't that nice? Don't you just love it as a parent to hear the voice of the child saying, Daddy, Daddy. And there's just something about that. You know, you're just like, hey, this is my son, this is my daughter. But you know, when God sent his son and he saved me into my heart, I now have this privileged relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, with my heavenly father. Look at verse number 12 of John chapter 1. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Hey, have you believed on his name? You're a son of God. You're a daughter. And by the way, when I say son of God, I'm talking inclusive with the ladies too. So I don't have to say son, daughter, son, daughter. You're a son of God. You're a child of God. Why? Because you believed what the gospel message was and you, you were born again. Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Have a look at what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Uh, by the way, the term born again is a relational term. When I was born on the, uh, the 27th of August, 1969, in McLaren Vale Hospital in South Australia, I was born into a family. I was born to, uh, to Ian Francis Stevenson and Janet Kathleen Stevenson. They were my parents. I was born into a family. When we were saved, you were born into a family where God is your father. And now you're in a, you, you are in a family environment that is conducive to growth and there's love and there's uh, 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 all the things that you want for in a family. It's, it's there. You know, when we think about our, our, our household, we've got adult kids and, uh, you know, they, 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 they never have to ask permission if they can go to the fridge. As a matter of fact, Robert practices that pretty freely. <laughs> He doesn't have to ask permission to go to the fridge to get something to eat. He's my son. He has access to everything in my house because of who he is in Paul Stevenson. But if Esther came to my house and she just walked in and started looking through the pantry and the fridge and started getting the bread and the butter and just started making herself something to eat, I'd be like, what's going on here? Hey. Hey, why is that? Well, she, in a, in, understand what I'm saying? She's not my daughter, so she doesn't have access to the rights that my son and daughter have. Right? You think about this. Israel, right, the children of Israel had, had access to all the rights of the Heavenly Father. When we got born again and born into the family, born into His kingdom, we too now, because we have been adopted into his family, have access to all the blessings of the family. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, think about it. That's why when Jesus asked us to pray, that we ought to pray boldness. Read it in John 14, 15, 16. Whatsoever you ask the Father, he will do it. He will give it. There just seems to be like this open checkbook. Oh, but pastor, shouldn't we pray in the will of Jesus? Yes, we know all of that. Come on. How many of us don't know by now that we need to pray according to the will of God? Right, so let's not put so many disclaimers on it now. We know that it's got to be according to the will of God, which is the word of God, is the will of God. So when I pray within the, within the boundaries of his word, I have access to everything that he said I can have access to. Amen. What a blessing. Have a look at this. We're in John 3, is that right? Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see... The kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There's two things in those verses that we read. Notice he said firstly that unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. Then he said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What's he saying about that? When you study the Gospels, when Jesus manifested his power, it was a manifestation of the power of the kingdom. Come on, is that right? It was a manifestation of the power and the kingdom. He said, unless you're born again, you're not going to see that. And by the way, you're not going to be able to enter into that. So when we got saved, we were born again into a family slash the kingdom of God. And now we are, we are in a kingdom that is just full of his majesty, his power. We have everything that we need. We shouldn't be powerless Christians. We shouldn't be downtrodden Christians. We ought to be Christians that walk in the, yes, in the humility of who we are, but in the confidence of who we are in Christ. I don't think Prince Harry or Prince William have an issue of who their identity is when they go to places and, and how people were, uh, you know, basically fall down before them and, 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 oh, you know, this and this, and they've got all these things that they have access to. Well, I'm the a, I'm a child of a king. I'm the child of a king. I don't have to beg, borrow, or steal, I don't have to grovel. Come on, is that right? See, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to retrain your thinking to Who are you in Christ? You're, you're, in a, you're a prince and a princess. If he is a king and you're his child, is that right? We're likened to princes and princesses. We have access to everything about the kingdom that is there. We, we can come boldly into the throne room of grace and whatever need that we have, we can come before him and say, Father! By the way, he says, I already knew you needed that. Now, we do understand that, that there are times when as a loving father, we may ask him for something because we think we need it, but he knows better. How many of us as fathers know that when our kids are growing up and they ask us for something, but we think, no, not at this time. I remember, I remember the first gun, I like shooting, I'm sorry for that, I like shooting, I, I, I grew up shooting and... Uh, my first gun. My dad had shotguns. He had a, a he had a 303. Ah, oh, you talk about a powerful weapon. 303, and he had a 22 pea shooter. Could have pea shooter. You know what I wanted to use? I wanted the 303. <laughs> he said, no way. Here's the 22. <laughs> oh, dad. By the way, you can kill almost anything with a 22 as well. Uh, when I got older and more mature, it was like, okay, here you go. Here's, here's the shotgun, here's the 303, here's the, here's the Winchester 3030, you know, the, old, the old cowboy one. <laughs> I love shooting. I would shoot anything that walked the flu or whatever. <laughs> You're in the middle of nowhere, what's going to happen? It's like, where, where are all these liberals, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's what, you know. So my dad knew that, that yeah, you can have it, but not, not yet. When you've grown, when you mature. So we understand that really when you study the Bible, God the Father is like that as well. I better move on because I'm, I'm staying here too long. I want, you to go, uh, uh, boy, I want you to go to Romans chapter 8 for a second. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then what? Yes. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be, we may be also glorified together. What a blessing. I mean, oh man, the book of Romans is such a, it's a book that you just can't read quickly through. You've got to read it and study and meditate. 
But if we're led of the Spirit, and by the way, we can't go back further because we don't have time. We'd be here preaching till the afternoon. But we know that now that we're saved, if you look at verse number nine, just quickly, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. So does the spirit of God dwell in you? Amen. Then the spirit leads you. And as the spirit leads you, the spirit of God is not going to lead an unsaved person. He will lead a saved person because they're a child of God. And if we're children of God, as the Bible says, then we're heirs, we're joint heirs with Jesus. Now, there is going to be an inheritance that is going to be future. Is that right? We've got a new body coming, we've got a new heaven, new earth, all that, all that's going to be. But you know that we can have part of our inheritance while we're here. We can access everything that we need while we're here. As a matter of fact, Paul calls us ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And an ambassador has all the power and authority of its sending nation while they're in an opposing nation. And anything that they need from their sending nation, they have access to. So as ambassadors, we, we can access anything that is rightfully ours because we're joint heirs with Jesus. Powerful stuff. So... Let's go back to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John. I, I, I want to give you now a practical reminder. All right, a practical reminder. Now, we're going to be using our fingers, so be ready to go to different places, all right? And here's a practical reminder. Look at verse number 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for, the, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So where, where are you situated in your position? Are you out of Christ or are you in Christ? We're in Christ. So if in him is no sin, now look at verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him... Sinneth not. Mm. Very interesting. But I want to talk about the law for a minute. The, the, when you witness to somebody, I don't know what you do. Jeff and I, we, we use different sort of tactics when we go out. But I'm convinced for Australians that the way that they're going to know that they're lost and on their way to hell is because they've transgressed the law of God. The law is for unsaved people. The law is the schoolmaster to bring that unsaved person to Jesus Christ. Sin is a transgression. It's a breaking of the law. So when you witness to somebody, you need to know what the law is. And, and, and God condensed it. There's about 600 odd laws in the Old Testament. He's condensed it down to the Ten Commandments. Most people know about the Ten Commandments. And so when you talk to someone and you say, uh, have you ever lied, which is false accusation, which is in the law, and they say, yes, well, you've just broken the law. And by, yeah, by the way, when you broke one, you've broken all. But you go on down the list. Have you ever stolen? Most people have stolen something. Mate, I've stolen cigarettes and all sorts. You know, I'm not proud of it, I'm just saying. Most people have stolen something in their life. Oh, so what does, if you steal something, what does that make you? Yeah, well, see, they're confessing now. I'm a liar and a thief. Have you ever blasphemed the name of Jesus? How many Aussies like to use the name of Jesus as a swear word? You know what I mean? So they've broken the law and you've got to get people to understand that they are lawbreakers. Now, I want to show you something that I, 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 I hope will, will be a blessing to you. Go back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Because in a nutshell, let me say, you are now no longer under the law. Oh. <laughs> wow. You're no longer under the law. You've been delivered from the law. The law was there for a purpose. As a matter of fact, let me just say this. I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Amen. <laughs> what? Uh, sorry, I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Now, in the New Testament, there's two. The law of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and might and strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. Right? All of those hang. Now, I'm commanded to love. 
If I love God, I'm not going to go worship false idols. If I love my neighbour, I'm not going to commit adultery with my neighbour's wife, all that sort of stuff, alright? But I'm no longer under, under that regime that I was once under because Jesus delivered me from that. Amen. Now I can love. Now have a look at this. Look at Romans chapter 7. Look at verse number 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, before we were saved, right, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. What's the next two words? But now we are delivered from the law... That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So this, uh, this, this practical reminder is to remind us of what brought us to that privileged relationship in Jesus Christ. It was the law. You and I could not keep the law. When we were in the flesh, did you notice, do you pick it up how Paul differentiates between the spirit man and the flesh? When we were in the flesh, before we were saved, we did everything that the carnal man did. We, we did it to excess. Man, we, had, we, had, we could do whatever we wanted to do. We could, we could fornicate, we could adulterate, we could drink and drug and all this sort of stuff because that was the carnal man. But when I got saved, I was delivered from the law so I can serve in newness of spirit. Amen. See, the law, I had not known sin but by the law. Sin revived when I knew what the law was all about. And I couldn't, by the way, no one can keep the law. That's the design of it. So that God can show us that we're, we're lawless. And there's only one person that could keep the law. Have a look at Romans chapter 8, if you would. Look at verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So who was the one that fulfilled the law? Jesus fulfilled the law. In his three years that he was on earth, he did no sin. He fulfilled the law and the prophet. And when you got saved, because of Jesus, the righteousness of the law is now fulfilled in you. Not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus Christ did. So do not allow yourself to be brought under the bondage of the law when Jesus Christ has brought you up out of that bondage. Isn't that what we said about the spirit of fear again to bondage? Hey, I could preach law, 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 law and bring you into bondage because I can control you better when you're in bondage. Hey, that's the truth. That's the truth. It's easier to control people when they're in bondage. But when you preach grace and liberty and freedom and what Jesus did for you, then you ought to, you ought to be skipping around the place because you're free. Amen. Newness of spirit. Amen. Man, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life, to serve him and praise him. And now that new resurrected, born again spirit man does not commit sin. Oh, I thought that was good. <laughs> you might not. Now, so the law's been fulfilled. Let me give you the last thing. I want you, let's go back to 1 John. We're going to probably go back. You might want to keep a finger in Romans. Go 1 John. Back to 1 John 3. I want now to give you this powerful reality. We've alluded to it through the message. What is this powerful reality? Verse 8 and 9, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose, 
the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Did you know that the Son of God is a destroyer? He's the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is destructive. Not my saviour. Yeah, let me tell you. You remember a while back we talked about uh, his whole vestige being splattered with blood when he comes down and passes judgment upon the lost and he's just going to go through and the blood up to the horse's bridles for 200 furlongs and all this. Listen, Jesus is no wimp, folks. He's a, he is a mighty man of war. Amen. And when Jesus Christ came, he came to destroy now, he came to, number one, destroy the works of the devil. And for the sake of time, in Hebrews 2, it says that he came that he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So he destroyed the works of the devil and he also destroyed the devil. Now, Luke, Luke in chapter 9, verse 56, he says, I did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So he didn't come to destroy humanity, he came to save humanity. Amen. That's the, that's the glory. And listen, this is, this is what people need to know. But 99, now can I, oh, that might be too harsh. 95% of churches are not getting the message out to people who need to hear it. We keep it confined in our own four walls. They need to know that the works of the devil have been destroyed. They need to know that the devil himself has been destroyed. But they also need to know that Jesus Christ came to save men's lives and not to destroy them. That was on the back of when the disciples said, Lord, shall we call fire down from heaven that they may be consumed? And Jesus said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. That's not the powerful reality that, that, that that's good. Look at verse number nine. Whosoever is born of God. Can I ask you, are you born of God? Yes or no? Yes. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Isn't that powerful? Yes. I, think, I think some of you struggle with that still. But hey, listen, study the Bible. Again, your spirit man cannot sin. That's saved, that's sanctified, that's sealed. It's the flesh that we have an issue with. Amen. It's the flesh, according to the scripture. Uh, let's go back. Come on, let's go back. It's, look, it's like Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. We don't need to get home for anything. People don't need to go back to Brisbane. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 13. For if ye live after the flesh, so you have, the, uh, you have the potential to live after the flesh if you want to do fleshly things, right? If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So how are you going to deal with that flesh? Isn't the flesh a problem? Do you hate the flesh or what? Man, I hate the flesh. Amen. Mate, that stinking rotten thing it is. Well, how are, we gonna, how are we going to deal with that? Through the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the flesh. Amen. Folks, let me tell you, you've got to be in the Word. It, there is no substitute. I don't care about Spurgeon's sermons, how many volumes of his sermons you have read. It doesn't negate your responsibility to be a man or woman of the book. Amen. Because it's through the scriptures that you're going to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Hey, let's not corrupt the scriptures. You corrupt the scriptures, you're going to weaken the sword. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's rotten, stinking New King James Bible. I don't care what version it is. It all needs to be burned up, I tell you. Oh, I'm getting, I've got Holy Ghost goosebumps right there. <laughs> You, you cannot substitute your, you can't substitute Bible reading. If you have a problem, you discipline yourself. He that hath no rule over his spirit, Proverbs 25 says, is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You've got to be disciplined in your Bible reading. Basics. It's basic stuff. Brother Chapman Stone, you're in the New Zealand army. Well, you call it an army. It's New Zealand, so it's like. <laughs> Did you not have to be disciplined? 
You have to be, and it's discipline that gets you up. It's discipline that gets you to do the things that you don't want to do. By the way, that's part of character. So you've got to be disciplined to be in the word because it's through the spirit you do mortify the deeds of the flesh and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Galatians 5.24 says that we are to crucify the flesh. Now, in first in first John 3, it talks about the seed because his seed remaineth in him. Go to Galatians chapter three and this will we'll close here. All right. We're nearly done. We're nearly done. His seed remaineth in him. You can't lose the seed if the seed's been planted. Oh, I can't go there. If I go there, we'll never finish. Look, Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is who? Right. right. So who is the seed? So if Christ is in you, if the seed remains in you and you can never lose the seed. Come on, you can't lose the seed. Therefore, if the seed remains in you, which is in your spirit, that's why you never sin. Your spirit man, your new man never sins. Flesh is a different thing. Let's go on. Look at this. Uh, verse 17. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ... The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul it, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed, that's Christ, should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hands of the mediator. Now, mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us under Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Whew, glory to God. The seed is Christ. And when you, when you were, man, it's such an amazing thing. You, you, when you got saved, you were placed in Christ. Christ got placed in you. You're just, your whole life should be wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And your, your new man, your new man, the new you, that's who you are. Do you have an identity crisis? Who are you? I'm the new man. I'm the, I'm the born again man. I'm, I'm the uncorruptible man as we looked at 1 Peter chapter 3. I am the righteous man. That's who I am in Jesus Christ. And I don't think there's anything wrong with a Christian saying that. Because that's what Jesus did for me. Does Paul Stevenson battle with the flesh? Yep. But I'm not going to let it rob me of who I am in Christ. There is, now, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We walk after that, that, new, that new spirit now that we have life in Christ. Amen. Amen. So do you have an identity problem? Do you have an identity crisis? If I ever hear any of you saying, I'm just a lay down filthy sinner, I will slap you silly. <laughs> because that is not who you are. That is not who you are. You're a child of God. Act like a child of God. You're a child of a king. Act like a child of the king. The Lord Jesus Christ is your brother. Hebrews chapter 2. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. Man, Jesus is my brother. He's my saviour. And by the way, you know when I talk to God the Father, God, I use, I use all of that. I say, Father, oh Lord Jesus, you're my brother and all this sort of stuff. I've never had a brother before. I had a sister. She was a pain in the knee. <laughs> it's good to have a brother. When you get a brother, it'd be good to have a brother. You tease your sister now, probably, don't you? You give her a hard time? Yes. <laughs> Train to do that. Brothers can be but that's who we are in Christ. That's our identity. Satan, who's part of the liberal left, 
wants to confuse you of your identity. But the scripture, <laughs> there's no substitute for the scripture. You've got to study the scripture to let you know who you are in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, we can't but say thank you. And sometimes words fail to express. Oh God, we're so thankful of who we are in Jesus Christ. Thank you that that can never be taken away from us. Thank you that the seed of the Saviour, the seed the Lord Jesus Christ, permanently dwells within us. Thank you that we're new creatures in Christ. Thank you that we have been justified, sanctified. Thank you for that wonderful identity. Help us, Lord, to, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the flesh. We have an enemy. We understand that. We're not naive enough to think that we don't struggle against that. But that's where sin lies. That's the, it's not me, but sin that is in my flesh. Help us, Lord. All of us have got sins of the flesh that we struggle with. And help us through the Spirit to put them to death. Lord, thank you for the patience of the people today. Thank you for their listening ear. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just continue to work in their hearts. And we, we ask, Lord, that you would bind the wicked one, for he would seek to steal the seed of the word out of our hearts. So, Father, I pray that that would be protected and that we would be changed as a result of who we are in Christ. Father, we love you. Bless and praise your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's sing that.